All right. Um, let's get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining uh, for this one of the security um, track talks. Um, we are here gathered to talk about secure Keystone deployment. And I'm Preeti Desai. I work for Symantec. Um, let's It's weird. It, the slides, it's looking very weird. Um, let, let's start talking about, uh, I, I'll give you just a little bit of overview of uh, what Symantec is doing with OpenStack. So we are building consolidated cloud for providing infrastructure and also platform services uh, so that the, um, the intelligent uh, the uh, application security inside applications can run on the in our cloud. A little bit about myself. Um, I have, uh, uh, I started working on uh, Norton Inside products where I was part of um, reputation based technology, which is tracking millions of files uh, even today. Uh, and um, rating their applications based on the file attributes like uh, age, uh, frequency, location, etc. Uh, then I was working on the semantic data analytics platform, which is a big data platform where uh, we are hosting um, security intelligence metadata for protecting mobile devices and PCs both. Um, and then I moved to uh, get started working on and involved with OpenStack uh, as we were forming this group within Symantec. Um, so I work as an OpenStack engineer uh, in our group and um, I primarily work on Keystone. <laughs> And uh, I'm also part of OpenStack security group. Um, it's, a very, it's a very cool group. And we just uh, heard about uh, that group, like in last presentation, what we are doing. Uh, and I'm also working as the open source uh, community of practice. I'm leading this practice so that uh, we can, we have a strong commitment of uh, giving back to the community. So we are hosting hackathons, meetups. Uh, we have blogs where uh, people can uh, share their expertise. So let's get um, start first before moving on. A big kudos to OpenStack Security Group uh, for OpenStack Security Guide and OpenStack Security Notes. These are wonderful and very helpful. And also, one more kudos to Sohel for uh, contributing and leading the effort on threat analysis on Keystone. It's very helpful. When we are going there and trying and running threat analysis on Keystone, all the work has been done and led by Sohel. So thanks. Um, so before. Um, so why the Keystone, uh, why is Keystone so critical? Why do we want to secure? Before going into there, let's just understand and set common ground on what is Keystone and how the authentication and authorization mechanism is implemented. So here is, uh, uh, here's the sequence diagram that we are going to walk through. Uh, on the left, we have the cloud user. Keystone, um, and then the three different uh, backends. Identity, which is can be SQL LDAP. Assignment, uh, SQL backend, and token, which we are using SQL backend. So uh, let's just go over how the authentication piece is implemented um, here. So user comes in and requests uh, for a token in Keystone. Basically, he's trying to authenticate himself. He sends username and password. Now, Keystone verifies that username and password with their um, identity backend. And it sends the hash of the password. It's not a clear plain text password. Then, um, once the, after the successful verification, 
um, it requests the metadata for the user tenant relationship. Does this user belong to this particular tenant or project or domain or not? After the successful verification and um, getting the information, what kind of role? It now basically uh, goes to token backend and says, OK, now create a token for this particular user based on the scope that he has requested. So it responds back with the token. And here uh, on the token backend, that token is being registered so that it can be revoked when the expiry when the token is expired. So now the user is has the basically he has authenticated himself in our cloud and has the authentication token. Now let's look at how the authorization piece work. Um, now with this token. Cloud user goes back to any of the OpenStack service or any external service and says, OK, here is my token. I want to access these resources. Let's say I want to boot a VM on Nova. I want to access uh, Object Store, uh, my objects on Swift. So now, based on the token format, OpenStack service goes back to Keystone and validates this token. Is this the token valid? Is it? Has it expired already? No. Does it allow the service usage and et cetera? So now, after the successful verification, so it, uh, OpenStack service has to go back to Keystone in case of UUID. If the token format is set to PKI, then it can basically uh, validate the token itself. Now, um, OpenStack service, after uh, verifying and validating the token, it basically executes the request and sends back the response. Now here we have set the com common ground of understanding what the Keystone is and how the authentication and authorization piece works in Keystone. And Keystone is nothing but, it's basically a single point of interaction and integration within all the OpenStack services. It maintains users, roles, tenants, all the services, catalog, all the endpoints. So imagine, I mean, this service is pretty, it, it, it's, it's very, um, it, it, we have to secure it. it. It's very important. It's very crucial. So now, um, in, uh, what kind of what kind of cloud assets does it contain? Um, and is there any type of attack possible on Keystone? Can it bring down the entire cloud? If Keystone is attacked, can it bring down entire cloud? Now, like I said, it is a gate gatekeeper for accessing your entire cloud. It basically allows you to access the OpenStack cloud. It has all these assets. And also, it is vulnerable to DOS. Let's look at how, um, what was our approach? What was our strategy ident to identify the vulnerabilities behind our deployment of Keystone? So basically, uh, what happened was we engaged Global Security Office at Symantec. We call it GSO. And um, there was interview sessions going on, uh, like in threat analysis, there are interviews going on. So we basically met with uh, technical uh, expert, uh, experts and also the um, the use case experts from the Keystone perspective. And we ran threat analysis and the penetration testing. And then we used the traceability matrix for coming up with the plan. What should we do? Once we identify the vulnerabilities, what should our approach be to uh, mitigate those? So we ran. Um, since all the threat modeling work was pretty much done by the OSSG group, we didn't have to spend that much of effort. We came up with this particular threat model diagram of our deployment. And it was based on Stride, 
Rob and Sohil pretty much covered um, the uh, details of threat modeling. So uh, what kind of security deficiencies did we discover using this threat model, this uh, data flow diagram? Let's look at the data flow diagram again. And if you notice, there are two Keystone instances. This is incorrect. We have three instances. Um, then we have the jump host from where a P, uh, uh, admin can log into the Keystone instances. We have the LDAP backend for the identity. And we have something called uh, CPE LMM instance for retrieving, for gathering uh, and retrieving all the uh, logs which are sent by Keystone and all the other uh, services that we are using. So, uh, and the red, red uh, dot dotted lines are um, basically, it's pretty much covering the management network and outside is the VPN network. So here, if you think about it, um, now we found out a vulnerability where the user credentials were very easy and uh, it was very easy to basically hijack those credentials because the communication between the clients and the Keystone instances was going over port number 5000, TCP 5000, which was um, not encrypted. So anybody can pretty much run a sniffing tool and hijack the credentials without knowing that person. Now, um, so this was one of the attacks. Next, um, so the access to cloud admin privileges for almost free. Um, now this one, the, um, in, in Keystone, if you deploy Keystone using the service token, or it's sometimes called shared uh, secret, it can pretty much act as a cloud admin. It can give you the cloud admin privileges. With the, just that token, you don't have to get yourself authenticated. You just that use that token and run admin privileges. Um, so we had configured that in a production environment, and in um, <laughs> and in addition to um, so anybody can, uh, for example, jump uh, log into the jump host and get into the Keystone instance and get to that admin token, but it's not that easy. But um, uh, that both of these has to be secured. So it's, it's not that easy, but imagine the service token, if anybody has wrote it down on posted because it's supposed to be secured and pretty long, so we have service token which is pretty long and very difficult to remember. So I have a colleague, for example, he wrote it down on posted um, now, anybody can get to that and run the admin privileges. So that was the another attack that we uh, discovered. Next was the uh, denial of service. There was a CVE discovered by Sohel, again, um, to come up with a denial of service attack in just single request. So let's say you can think about sending multiple requests and you can, uh, you can still have the DOS, but if you um, limit the number of requests per second, then you can pretty much avoid the DOS attack. But with this vulnerability, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, you can just uh, have the DOS in just one single request. Um, then next, uh, we found out that the Keystone con file, which is pretty much, which has all the uh, good stuff, LDAP credentials, MySQL credentials, um, it's like a keys to the kingdom. Now, that particular file, do, should we keep it secured? Or um, how secure should that be? Now, uh, next we uh, found out about leaking the sensitive information in our log files. This was possible 
and I'll sh I will go into detail of how, but uh, we found out that uh, username, passwords, and tokens were getting logged in plain text in our log files. And last but not the least, um, the unauthorized access to the MySQL server. Um, if if somebody, if a malicious user can somehow get into the management network, he was able to get into directly into the MySQL database and um, run the malicious activities. And we found out many more, but just for this talk, let's go by, uh, let's go into each of these and see uh, how did we mitigate. So, uh, we came up with our security plan based on the uh, type of attack and uh, the kind of uh, risks that it brings. We laid it down on the traceability matrix and prioritized based on the uh, threat agents and vectors. So we decided that, okay, let's uh, look at these three and then uh, see how, how much it can help and make our uh, Keystone deployment secure. So, um, starting with the, uh, the, the very first attack that we just saw, user credentials were very easy to see and hijacked. So, just from the VPN network, anybody can run the sniffing tool and get to the request. It, this is just over REST API. We have username and password, and it's exposed. So we uh, decided, okay, let's encrypt our um, traffic going back and forth to Keystone. And this is the approach that we followed. So we have a user, we have a public APIs and private APIs, the load balancer. We have the hardware load balancer VIPs, two separate VIPs, one for public and one for admin. And we have three Keystone instances uh, the public APIs are being served on 5,000, and the admin APIs are being served on 35357. So we have now um, the SSL clients and SSL servers on the load, hardware load balancer. When the traffic comes from a user, it's being encrypted, and hardware, the load balancer decrypts that traffic. We are using the certificate, uh, the uh, trusted CA certificate. Now it decrypts the traffic and then re-encrypts it for uh, the Apache mode SSL uh, module to be re uh, and decrypted again. So we are using two different types of certificates, the trusted CA authority, and also the self-signed. So you just think it was okay to say it's going to be in the in effect between the hardware load balancer and the keystone server itself, even though you have a new trust. Yes. Why is that? Uh, we wanted to encrypt uh, basically the end-to-end -end, uh, traffic uh, without oh, having okay. any. Yes. yes. Um, then we looked at the another attack, which was the keystone.con file, which is pretty much has all the good information. And we found out that it has read permission by everybody who can log into that server. So we decided to secure it with creating a service account, um, a specific service account for Keystone, and then restricting, that, uh, restricting privileges for that file to just read and write by the service account, by the owner. So restrict the ownership to the service user, and then restrict to read and write by the owner. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's just adding one more layer of security. It's, it's This is better to have it 
read uh, read a uh, permission by everybody. It's just a little more secure. <laughs> um, now we looked at the uh, the uh, service token that we were using. You don't have to keep your service token this long. You can pretty much use like password ABC or whatever. <laughs> it's up to you. This is actually uh, fake. I have just created it for this uh, presentation. And this is the MD5 of Keystone text itself. So it's not that difficult to uh, get to. So Keystone service token, it's, uh, it's basically used for bootstrapping the Keystone. It gives you the cloud admin privileges. And if an uh, attacker gets, it to, gets uh, to that token, then it pretty much can uh, create, register any bad services uh, and run that service against you. And you would never know. Um, so what we decided to do is basically disable service token. And this is how you disable it. <coughs> Just comment out the uh, admin token from your con file, Keystone con file, or be better, just remove this line. Uh, also comment out or uh, remove the lines uh, from the token auth med middleware. Uh, the above, it should be suffice. Yeah. Right, right. So you remove this uh, admin token auth middleware from the uh, paste file, keystone paste file. Now, um, so who is the cloud admin now? We got rid of the service token. Who is the cloud admin? Nobody. <laughs> so before even you disable that token, be sure you have a, somebody to be cloud admin. So this is how we approached to be cloud admin. And we followed uh, Florence blog. I'm sure he's not here. He's presenting uh, on Swift at the very same time. But he has written a very uh, nice blog on creating cloud admin and domain admin using the existing source code. And you don't have to apply any patches. So this is how we created the uh, cloud admin. We have a separate domain dedicated just for the admins. So it's called, for example, this is not the name again. I've just um, morphed it. Cloud admin domain. Then you can grant admin role on this particular domain to an appropriate user or an appropriate group. And update the keystone policy.json file. Uh, there is a line, basically, there is a rule for the cloud admin in the policy.json file. Um, it says admin domain uh, ID. Basically, replace this particular uh, ID with the actual uh, domain ID. And this will bring you the privileges to cloud admin. Yes. No. V3 policy sample, cloud sample. Right. So we are using um, V3 APIs, and that's what uh, we, had the, we had to copy over the policy file from the uh, cloud sample. It exists in the same directory under uh, Etsy Keystone, so it's very easy to find. Now, um, we found out that some. Um, there is a role admin already. Uh, 
Adam Young, Keystone Core. Sorry for the, I have a head cold, so I sound worse than usual. Um, there's, uh, the roles are not supposed to be global. What you're seeing there by is admin going, do you have the admin role on anything that comes in here is a throwback to the bad old days when roles were global. And now roles are scoped to something. And what, sh what the cloud admin, or excuse me, the, the cloud sample policy file took as the default is for doing things that are domain level, like adding new users, because you're adding a user to a domain, you should have admin on that domain. So what, what she's alighting is that you want admin to be admin on the thing that you're managing, and you need to have a separate policy file, the, the better policy file, in order to have those more fine grained roles, role assignments. Clear as mud? Too easy? Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. So um, then we found out that we were leaking some of the sensitive information um, into our log files. Uh, for example, passwords and tokens. How was this possible? Why were we doing this? Uh, what it made passwords and tokens appear in log files? Because we were using debug mode. It's obvious. <laughs> then we had to disable the debug mode. And also, there is not just the debug mode that it makes log, uh, the passwords and tokens appear in log files, but there is one more. Um, so before going to there, if you have the debug mode on, for some reason, if you want to keep that mode on, you better upgrade to the Keystone client to this uh, release because the patch was applied um, to not log the sensitive information like passwords and tokens to the log files. And there is an OpenStack security note already out there. So now, uh, if I disable debug mode, I should be pretty confident that there are no passwords or tokens uh, logged into the log messages, but which was not the case. So even the info level logs, they were contained, uh, there were the tokens going out. So again, the, there is a security note, OSSN, on this particular um, risk, and um, you can basically uh, mitigate um, the logging of the, logging of the uh, tokens by setting the uh, log level to one instead of info. And this can be done in the logging.conf file. So Keystone has the, uh, basically you can specify what is your logging configuration in Keystone, and you can specify this. Now, tokens get um, cached. They are cached in. Uh, So, uh, so that like Adam was saying, tokens are cached from on the other OpenStack services. They cached it, but not the Keystone. And it's basically uh, there's a revocation cycle going on, and you can set the uh, expiry time in the Keystone conf file itself uh, for expiry the token um, valid validity. So now uh, DOS. With this single request, we found out that it was possible, based on the CVE, that you can actually um, uh, apply, uh, have the DOS attack on the Keystone instance. And this is how, basically, this is the JSON payload for um, generating, for basically generating the token. Now, if you tweak this JSON payload, you can actually have the 
uh, DOS attack on Keystone. Just repeat the methods for some, uh, just repeat the methods, same method, and it was possible. So now, uh, Keystone team basically applied the patch and sanitized the methods list to remove the duplicates. So it's not no longer um, a risk. And the impacted versions were uh, the mostly the uh, 2013 versions. And the a patch was applied during the Ice House release, too. And also, it was backported to Havana. Havana is end of life now, but it was backported to Havana. So upgrade the Keystone version and use the new, uh, the any version about this. So thank you, everyone. Any questions? Let me start off with an answer. Um, you asked about uh, encrypting in the keystone.com file. Um, I would like to go further. So there are two uh, re resources that Preeti re uh, referred to in there. The second one was the LDAP credentials. And this is the easier one to mitigate. Um, the general approach should be that LDAP is read only anyway, because you're using a corporate AD to read the stuff out of. The, the use cases where you have to have read write access to LDAP are, are minuscule. And I just kind of forget that that exists, that LDAP is really for identity, it's read only. Um, in that case, you can do one of two things. If your corporate LDAP is globally readable anyway, just do an anonymous bind. If you drop the user ID and password out of there, then it will do anonymous bind, and there, there's no credential in there to attack. Um, the second is to create a non-privileged user. And actually, for free IPA, this is what we have to do, because we don't have that. So you put a user in there specifically to only be able to read. And again, they you know um, eliminate credentials, and then it, if that gets compromised, it's not really an issue, because all they can do at that point is, is to read it. So first, mitigate at that level, because it, sh it should be read-only data. The SQL one's a little bit more problematic, because you, you, you just keep pushing back and pushing back and pushing back, and then you get to the answer of all things security, which is Kerberos. Oh, come on. Yeah. Um, I would love it if I could use Kerberos credentials to talk to the database. You can if you use the Postgres backend. Now, it's not full SASL, so you can't use it to encrypt and talk, so you still have to do TLS. But if you use a Postgres backend, you could do a, a key tab. But again, you have to correctly protect the key tab. So it, it's the same, same set of issues. So with the Postgres backend, you can do that. Unfortunately, we don't have that for, uh, for MySQL. But um, I don't know what we could do with the password. It probably should be in a different config file at a minimum. Um, that was one of the things that we were talking about, is being able to separately configure a bunch of different components. Um, I, I wish I had a better answer for you there. Um, and the other thing is, I, you heard me, I, she's awesome. So I, I don't want to ever come across like I'm sniping her. This is the first time I've actually found something to actually chastise you for. And that is that the whole remove the, um, the service token from the Keystone config file, that is in the deployment guide. And that is normal deployment mechanism. And if you're not doing that, you are in a state of sin and go and ask for penance and go edit your keystone.com file to get rid of that. So that is baseline. Okay, cool. Thanks, Adam. Any more questions? Um, so the question is what is the best approach for the two factor authentication? Well, you come to semantic. <laughs> we already have two factor authentication. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> We are actually exploring. Uh, we haven't. Uh, it, it's still in uh, design phase, and we are. We were trying. We were uh, basically trying to use something like with Radius plugin, but we haven't been able to um, come up with a concrete solution. But uh, uh, you can. I mean, uh, you can get back to us, and we'll provide you more details. No. No.
couple ways we could go with that. Um, so I, the ideal would be that it's not Keystone's job to actually authenticate. My, my push is that, oh, actually, I do want to address one other thing in, as a backup to that. Um, so talking about the port 5000 and, and uh, insecure thing there. Um, if you've run DevStack uh, recently, you'll notice that we've changed the default deployment mechanism for Keystone to, from being deployed in a Python-specific web server called Eventlet to being deployed behind Apache HTTPD. Um, and one of the things that this gives us is it gives us the ability to use a, the native support in the Apache modules for authentication. So for instance, for Kerberos, um, I don't want to have to implement that in Python because doing crypto in Python is really, really slow and painful, and then there's issues with threading. So we inherit the Kerberos authentication from the, from the modules. So that should actually be the answer for two-factor auth, that if we can get two-factor auth on the web server, then it's not really a question of, of Keystone doing that. Now, that's... That's speaking strictly in terms of Keystone, the server. Now you still need to find a way to make all that stuff happen at Keystone, the client, and Horizon talking to Keystone. And it, that's always the progression of things there. So it's not really an answer. Even if we had two-factor auth to Keystone, that would only work if you were doing a custom script or something like that. With, with the methods thing there too, that was originally going to be for multi-factor. We never went in and said that all these have to pass in order to get a token, which would be pretty trivial to add. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Oh, you have questions?